So this begins our uh, session of courses for this uh, week. Um, as you will notice during the week, uh, pretty much probably every course will come from a completely different point of view. So this is my personal take on uh, where I see cognitive science going, and uh, you don't have to assume that this is the approach. Um, personally, I, I'm in favor of it. You know, I'm biased because of that, but um, you know, remember in the afternoon, the question, is it cognitive science? Is it cognitive sciences? Well, this is one version of cognitive science. And in my mind, it's a growing movement. And the days uh, of cognitive science, of the, when it was founded as an official discipline with an official society, where basically the mind was equated with a digital computer. And in those days, people didn't really differentiate between computer science and cognitive science almost. Okay, because any algorithm that you were working on was potentially realizable in the brain, or so, so people thought. But in the, in the subsequent decades, I'm not going to go through all the history here, but in the subsequent decades, more and more people thought that maybe uh, a better way of approaching the mind, a more fruitful one, is to think of the mind as embodied, embedded in an environment, extended through our tools and social resources, you could also say experiential, enacted, brought forth through our actions. And there's another one here that's going to be the focus uh, of today's course, which is technological. And to some extent, uh, that's one of the ways in which we can differentiate uh, the mind of the human, the human mind, and the mind of animals. So all of the other E's here, uh, I think, apply to mind in general. But technological is something that uh, seems pretty special and is rarely found in other species. And not to the extent that we find it in humans who take it to the extreme. So here's uh, performance artist Stellark who said, what, why should we just have two arms? Let's make another arm. And let's have three arms. And um, he's doing all kinds of uh, weird experiments of growing, I don't know, ears out of his arm and, I don't know, uh, just trying to manipulate what does embodiment mean. So why is this interesting? Well, to some extent, it's because the body had been kind of uh, relegated to something separate from the mind. Okay, we've heard about dualisms already in the morning. So the classical Cartesian view was that the body is part of the material world, the physical world, and that mind is identified with some kind of conscious substance and that was located somewhere else. And of course, then the question is, how do these two connect? Right? How do you get from the sensation in your hand to something like you know, burning pain? Right? And that problem has stayed with us for a while. So that's the stick card in you know, 1600s. Okay, so almost half a millennium later, we're still pondering these questions. One breakthrough, or in my mind a breakthrough, came with the philosophy of uh, Edmund Husserl, um, the founder of phenomenology, who said that, well, part of the problem is that we've neglected to carefully analyze the subjective side of this dualism. And if we do that, we realize that there's also a body there. In other words, the body is not just a physical thing, it's also a lived thing, something that we live through, that we experience, we inhabit. We are bodies, even from a subjective point of view. Right? We're not like remotely floating around and controlling our bodies like puppets, at least not if you're not schizophrenic. Right? So in that sense, the problem is not just between a mental substance somewhere else and a physical body, but between a physical body and a lived body. And this is the kind of starting point for the inactive approach to cognitive science, to say that uh, a serious cognitive science has to have an answer to this problem. How does mind and matter relate? Okay, that's one of the core questions of cognitive science. The traditional answer was, well, uh, it's like a virtual machine, a computer running on the hardware. That's how uh, we can cross this divide. This alternative picture here says that actually it's the phenomenon of life which incorporates both a physical side in its body, a living body, which is a special kind of object, 
And on the subjective side, it has a lived body, which is a special part of your experience. And both of those are unified in just life. Okay, so that's the kind of, very briefly, but just to give you an idea, the kind of theoretical philosophical background that I bring to my work. Now, how that does this apply to um, technology? Just like uh, I just said, there's this uh, traditional computational paradigm and then this kind of an active embodied paradigm. Same applies to human-computer interaction. So in the traditional computationalist approach, human-computer interaction is viewed as something like this. Okay, so the general picture of the mind, to some extent, can be characterized as a sense-think-act sequence. It's a linear process. You get some input, you do some information processing, and you create an output. Then, in the environment, you have an interface. Okay, and that interface generates inputs to you, and your outputs do something to the interface. The point here is that what the interface does and what you do are conceptualized as independent. And to some extent, this is evident if you think of certain kinds of interfaces. So here in 1949, this is a, a computer. Right? So how do you interact with this kind of system? Right? It's very hard to get any kind of smooth flow kind of interaction with this kind of system. And so if this is your inspiration to think about human-computer interaction in general, um, obviously, you're going to have a very um, you know, uh, detached, you know, symbolic, abstract kind of conception of what that interaction is like. If you think that the mind is embodied and can be extended through tool use, then the picture looks a little bit different. In that case, we have some kind of individuating agent, a living process, and there's the environment with which it is coupled, and it regulates that coupling, but ideally, if it's a good interface, like I don't see my glasses right now, I, I just completely forgot I'm wearing a microphone, right? That interface disappears from our experience. It recedes into the background, and yet it still modulates the way in which we relate to our world. So I, sometimes I wanted to call this uh, artificial embodiment to acknowledge that in the human case particularly our embodiment is also always related with technology and this has some implications okay so one thing that we didn't talk about today but uh, for those of you who are interested in AI it's just you know kind of like a brief snapshot of where I, my, my stance is here first is that if mind is really rooted in a living body then this means serious trouble for replicating our minds artificially. Because these computers, like the one in front of me right now, are very different from living organisms in their material composition, in their organization. And in fact, it's so hard to even understand how life is organized that up to now, every time you hear someone in the news saying, oh, they've created life artificially, you can immediately just say, that can't be true. And then if you look at the details, usually it's something like, oh, we took all these components of other living beings and we reorganized them, and hey, it's kind of functional, or something like that. But really, creating life from scratch is currently out of our reach, even though people have been trying for decades, if not centuries, to do it. So that shows us how hard it is to understand the living organization. So that's very bad news for traditional AI and robotics. Right? If, it, if you want to replicate human-level intelligence in an artificial machine, but human-level intelligence depends on having a living body, then that would mean that our robots have to have a living body, and we are nowhere close to doing that. Okay, so all this hype about you know, deep learning and Google DeepMind and so on, just take it with a grain of salt. Okay, those are limited uh, application areas. On the other hand, there is a positive message here. If mind is embodied in life then this means profound new opportunities for transforming our minds artificially. In fact, we're doing this all the time, it's just that we don't realize it. Right? So this is good news for human-computer interaction. Okay, so just think about how our smartphones transformed our lives, transformed the world, transformed how we connect with each other, transformed how we can relate to old schoolmates that are now on the other side of the world. Okay, these are really transformative technologies. They change the way we see the world and how we see each other. And I expect more of that to come into the future. 
especially once we understand how these technologies integrate themselves into our embodiment. That's for the kind of engineering side, right? So if you want to become rich quickly, don't bet on deep neural networks, bet on human-computer interfaces. That's where the future is. Okay, in science, though, what does this mean? It means that we might have at our hands a tool for systematically studying the mind-body relationship. For if mind is embodied and using technology transforms our embodiment, then technology can transform our minds. And we can do so in a systematical manner by varying the parameters of our technology that we use in a systematic manner and seeing how does that affect our experience. If I use auditory feedback in my system, how is the experience? If I use tactile feedback, how is the experience? If there are delays, how is that experience changed? If I use my thumb to use my phone, how is that different from speaking to it? I don't know. There are all kinds of ways in which we can now look at how the way we relate with our technology changes the way we experience the world. And that's studying the mind-body relationship in a systematic, practical way. Okay? And so, you know, I'm not the first one to to notice that technology makes a difference to our experience and to our embodiment. In fact, uh, in psychology, it's a whole field of tool studies, tool use studies. We're not going to go through uh, this evidence here. I just want to highlight some of the findings. One is that tool use changes our body schema. That means our kind of unconscious, implicit way in which we move is changed by the tools that we use. Right? So if you were just, I don't know, playing the guitar and then afterwards reaching for a glass of water, for example, your grip will be different because you just were practicing a different kind of movement. If you learn to use a new tool, that actually rewires your brain and you become a different kind of body that is now adapt at using that kind of tool. Along with that comes a change in perceived space. So there's some interesting studies that show that if you use a rake or a stick to grab things, they will look closer to you. If you just use a laser pointer to point to them, they will look further. So just how you perceive your space will depend on what kind of tools are at your disposal. And the same is true of your own body. How you perceive your body also depends on the tools. So they made some tests where if you use a long stick, and then afterwards, they basically ask you to close your eyes and they point to your arm, not point, they touch your arm in different places and you're supposed to point to where they think you're touching. It basically is as if your arm had become extended. So you feel as if your arm is longer just because you had used a tool previously. And this can go to extremes again, just to highlight some you know, famous pieces of research. Here, someone is having a camera looking down at his body, and there's a camera on top of this um, mannequin, okay, also looking down. And what the person sees in his uh, goggles is the camera of the, the mannequin. And what the person in the middle does is just stroke them in a synchronous way. And after doing this for a little bit, suddenly you have the strange sensation that your body is the mannequin's body, that actually you're looking down at a mannequin. Okay, so basically, it's called the body swap illusion. Another piece of work that, using a similar kind of setup, here the camera is behind the person, looking at your own back of the head, so to speak. So what you see is your own back of the head. And again, what he's doing is he's having two pointers, and he's touching you in the chest and moving it closer to the camera. And after a while, people have the sensation of actually being where the camera is and looking at them from the outside, a kind of out-of-body experience. And some friends of mine in Japan had this uh, crazy idea to substitute your entire reality. So what they were doing is having a complete vision camera, taking, for example, all the possible angles of this room. Then the person has goggles on, and he just sees everything in life, but he has a, a, a motion sensor inside, so they can track where he's looking in space. And then without him knowing, suddenly they switch from the live feed to the pre-recorded video of the space. So he's still looking around, looking at the space, but actually he's looking at a video recording of the space. And people don't notice the transition. And then you can do freaky things like, suddenly you see yourself walking into the room, even though you thought that you were just seeing the space. Right? And it really freaks people out. So that basically shows 
that um, there's a lot of potential here. We can really go to extremes. Um, so, so my kind of take here is that we need to rethink AI in a human-centered way, okay? so from AI to HCI, human-computer interaction. Because although our capacity for recreating natural intelligence or human intelligence in autonomous systems is limited, I think, our own embodiment actually opens us with these possibilities for a self-transformation by designing new technological interfaces that reshape our existence. Right? And here, just basically, our creativity is required. Pretty much anybody can start to learn how to program simple apps on your iPhone or whatever. That, you know, if they have the right idea, will suddenly be adopted by millions of people. Right? And they will change how they, they live their daily lives. And so I think that instead of trying to recreate human intelligence and, you know, in a few years well, the world will be dominated by androids or some kind of like crazy fantasy scenario like that, we should focus our attention on how can we use human-computer interaction in order to extend our capacities and help us to realize uh, our potential in the best possible way. And this is already happening to some extent in the industry. So the reason why the iPhone was successful and other phones not so much, has little to do with the functionality of the iPhone. Okay, so most smartphones were able to download your emails, let you browse the web, take pictures, you know, photo cameras were around for a long time, right? You have your address book, I don't know what else, you know? You can play Tetris or something. But it was the experience of interacting with that phone that changed everything. It was like, wow, this is a different way of using this device. It's not the function, it was the experience of it. And so now we have to understand what are the underlying principles that make us experience things in this way. And that applies to all technology, to cars. Every car drives. Okay, so how do you decide between different cars? Well, it's how it feels to you to drive it, how it looks to you. Computer is the same, you know, do I get a you know, Mac Air or you know, Toshiba or whatever? It's not because this one can run Microsoft Word and the other one can't, because they all can do whatever they want. You know, any program, you can run it on any machine. But it's not the functions, again. right? It's not what the, the device is capable of. It's how you interact with it that's the deciding factor. Okay, so the person who understands the principles between, of human-computer interaction and how that relates to our subjective experience in a systematic way can make a lot of money. Because right? you can design the next phone and say, that experience is even better than the previous ones. Well, people will buy it. Right? Anyway, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to switch back to the research mode. One of the tools that has been uh, particularly uh, useful in studying uh, perception are sensory substitution devices. So let's have a look at them in more detail. Sensory substitution means to transform the characteristics of one sensory modality into stimuli of another sensory modality. That's simple enough. Okay, that's what was the original definition. But it assumed a kind of psychology in which our perception modalities are fixed and immutable and independent. And that view has fallen a little bit out of favor. So some people now prefer to talk about sensory augmentation, for example. Right? So imagine that now you can perceive, I don't know, infrared, okay? or ultraviolet, or I don't know. Uh, you know. We'll see some examples. Or stock market fluctuations, right? Experience them as if it was a perception. Well, those are not substitutions anymore. They're augmentations. You're, you're experiencing things that, biologically speaking, you wouldn't have to been able to experience in the first place. So let me give you some examples. From the Eagle Man Lab, um, they have what they call the VEST, Versatile Extrasensory Transducer. One of its basic principles is sound-to-touch substitution, but actually can do a lot of things. And uh, the pitch for this and how they got to fund this was that actually, what if we were able... Oh, sorry, let me explain a little bit. So they have these uh, vibrotactile arrays on, on the VEST that vibrate in different patterns. For example, um, you know, you can activate and deactivate motors in these different ways. Like they can move, they can have different patterns, and so on. And the, their long-term goal was to 
uh, increase the information capacity of perception so that, for example, you would be able to constantly play, I don't know, stock market changes uh, onto your belly, you know, just vibrating different ways. And after a while, you'd be able to just perceive the tendencies uh, of the market just through your perceptual modality. That's kind of their idea here. In fact, there are many possibilities and many remain unexplored. So again, it's, you know, uh, anybody with a good idea of how to use these interfaces can run with it. And it's quite simple to make these new interfaces. So you can tactile visual substitution is a classic one. Tactile auditory substitution, tactile distance, vestibular, magnetism, or different kinds of tactile, auditory, visual, you know, just make up your own combination and see what happens. Historically, one of the first ones uh, was made by Bahirita, the tactile visual substitution system. And they got some kind of like dentist chair of the old kind, right? Um, you have at the back the, the uh, electric st stimulators and a camera. And then basically uh, the, what the camera sees is then played back on, you, on your skin. Uh, and here's a report uh, of what the subjects perceive. And this grabbed a lot of uh, attention. Um, they say, our subjects spontaneously report the external localization of stimuli. And that sensor information seems to come from in front of the camera rather than from the vibrotactors on their back. Okay, one of the first, because this is 69, right? So this is one of the first pieces of evidence that actually maybe the technology transforms the way we experience the world, right? What's happening on your skin is no longer important. Actually, what you perceive is what's happening with the camera. Okay, and here was a kind of more recent version uh, where it's already miniaturized and then they were showing pictures of people and they were, they were able to recognize it. Um, here's a subjective report of a blind person. Let me just highlight a couple of things. He says, It is impossible to pass over in silence the dramatic impact of gaining access to a whole new world of sensory experience. The high point of the experiment occurred when I saw myself for the first time. You can imagine that, right? You've been blind your whole life, and then suddenly you see yourself for the first time. So, so this is the kind of thing that the, these human, uh, human computer interfaces can transform people's lives. In this case, of helping someone with a disability to regain the, that ability. But like I said, it's not limited to that. This uh, technology uh, then was further miniaturized into this kind of little tongue uh, array in which they used little electric currents to uh, represent different kinds of information. One of the applications was to translate the vestibular information, so how you're you know, positioned in relative space, onto your tongue. And in that case, people who had a dysfunction in their vestibular system would stop feeling the whole world like you know, disbalanced. And they can also use it um, for perceptual tasks. Here's Bajarita showing off uh, his device. But as you see in this picture, it doesn't look so comfortable, right? I mean. Imagine having that thing in your mouth the whole time and like giving you electric shocks all the time to give you information about the world. And I think although his company is still around, it's, in my mind, it has never taken off properly, you know, despite you know, the nice advertising pictures. Um, and you have to imagine also, and this is like a design question, right? Imagine you're a blind person. And now, in order to be able to perceive, you have to have this thing in your mouth all the time. And so you, now you cannot even speak anymore, and you're marked by walking around with a cable coming from your mouth. So maybe that's why it wasn't so widely adopted, right? Or one of the reasons. And this is another, it's a bigger question. We can talk about maybe this, maybe at the end, and what you think about it. but. Uh, a lot of the times, it's these engineers just seem to be so removed from the reality of the people who are supposed to use the technology. Here's another one called The Voice, which uh, translates uh, an array, pixel array, an image, into uh, sound. And it's just basically, it sounds a little bit like noise, regulated noise. And you're supposed to pick out the different frequencies and pitches changes and so on. So this is what it looks like. 
and they did some experiments with it um, where, where subjects were able to distinguish between the different objects. Uh, what might be the problem with this kind of technology if you're blind? Well, you cannot hear anything anymore, right? You have headphones on and you're playing this noise to help you see, but basically you won't be able to hear the car coming, you won't be able to hear if someone calls your name, right? So you're basically trying to replace one disability by introducing another disability, right? So, I don't know. Right? People don't think about these things so detailed. Nevertheless, some, they did some long-term studies with uh, some people, and supposedly, it does transform their experience. Okay? Uh, for example, down here, I've developed it where one day I was washing dishes, and without thinking, I grabbed the towel, washed my hands, and looked down into the sink, to make sure that the water had got out, and I realized, oh, I can see down, I can see death. Right? And again, this kind of like a realization moment, my God, I'm actually experiencing something visual. And here's another uh, caveat for potential interface designers. Turns out that the affected modality was not limited to vision. Turns out that also touch now introduces experiences that they didn't have before. So uh, the experimenter says, if you were to touch things, you wouldn't get any visual experiences through that. Yes, I can, she says. If I pick up a pencil, I feel pencil, I see pencil. Even if you touch it, he asks. If you touch an object with your hands, you have an experience of seeing it. Yes, touch is vision. So this is, a, you know, I don't know if this is a feature or a bug of the interface, but it was definitely not planned by the designers of this. Right? So we have to be careful a little bit. You know, if you have long-term use of technology, there will, might be all kinds of unexpected side effects of how it transforms our experience. In this case, it's relatively benign, but who knows what other effects there can be, right? And it's also true of our phones and our social media. We don't really understand yet what are all the full implications of how these technologies transform our lives. Here's a, another example from some, some colleagues in Germany called Fieldspace. Um, where they have a belt, and it has motors all around, and always the one that's pointing to north is the one that's active and vibrating. Okay, so you move around, and you always have a sense of where is north, which in this case, I believe, is somewhere that way. So you would always be able to tell even though you're indoors. And when they did that, they found all kinds of behavioral and experiential effects. Um, and they conclude that um, a new sensor motor contingency was learned, so a dependency between movement and sensation, and integrated into the behavior, and it affected the perceptual experience. Uh, here are some subjective reports. One person says, it was different from mere tactile stimulation because the belt needed a spatial feeling. Feeling, by the way, is a word that people commonly use to describe these experiences. A kind of a neutral term, you know, to feel something. And in Spanish it works too, or sentir, no? It's like something like between knowing and something affective and something like, like perceptual but not quite. And so a lot of the times people lack the verbal vocabulary to really adequately try to describe these experiences. He also says, I was intuitively aware of the direction of my home or of my office. For example, I would wait in line in the cafeteria and spontaneously think, I'm living over there. Um, and th th there's more text um, here. But uh, what's interesting here is that one of the consistent effects was that it seemed to create a larger spatial awareness. So, for example, maybe most of the time we're like in localized spatial memory. So you know how to move around in your house. You know how to move around in, in let's say, your institute or on campus, or maybe in the town where you used to grow, grew up. But you have no idea how these are spatially interrelated. But having a constant signal of where's north suddenly somehow locked all these different spatial, you know, situations into one larger overarching spatial awareness. Now, moving closer to the device that I have here, and that I'm going to spend a little bit more, more time on, uh, here's again something from some Japanese colleagues 
what they call the, the haptic radar, and they created these little devices which are basically uh, in, uh, infrared uh, sensors, which send out you know, infrared light, it comes back, and the time it takes for the light to come back gives you an idea of the distance. And uh, their idea was basically to mimic uh, whiskers. Okay, so a lot of animals use their hair, like, like this, right? to know the space around them, to know whether they can fit through a gap. Or in this case, humans don't have that, right? Okay, we have whiskers in our face, but they're not really functional. They're just, you know, there to make us look pretty or something, right? I cannot really feel whether I fit through the door by seeing whether my beard fits through the door. Um, but in animals, this works. So their idea was like, well, let's give humans the capacity to have virtual whiskers. So basically, they have this idea of having suits and helmets with these little sensors everywhere, sending out infrared beams, and then these will vibrate in proportion you know, to the distance to the object. So if something is closer, it will vibrate more. So then even if something is behind you, like in this kind of like I say, um, construction site scenario, you're aware that something is swinging behind your head, you know, and that can be very important in certain environments. One of the things that I like about this uh, approach is that it's quite minimal. Okay, uh, with the things like the vest, for example, where they basically went to the opposite extreme and say, "What's the highest bandwidth that we can feed through our skin?" Basically, here it's much more limited and focal. But I think, for that reason, it makes it much easier to incorporate into your embodiment and to learn to use it, to incorporate it into your experience. And in fact, uh, it's not just more learnable that way, it also lends itself better to doing science with this. So some colleagues from the University of Compiègne in France, at the uh, Technological University of Compiègne, have this minimalist approach, minimalist experimental paradigm, which they see align with these new uh, tendencies in cognitive science. And they have this to say about it. By reducing the sensory inputs to a strict minimum, we force a spatial and temporal deployment of the perceptual activities, which makes it possible to obtain a, obtain a complete recording and control of the dynamics of interaction. And this is some of the... Uh, I, I buy this completely. It's one of the design principles that also in our group uh, we make use of. And the thing is that if you work with vision, for example, it's such a highly developed modality already that it's very hard to study its dynamics, especially just from the outside, if you don't want to you know, go into the details of the visual system. So what they do is basically say, hang on, what we're going to do is create a new interface that you'd have no idea how to use, okay? And we're going to reduce the bandwidth to a minimum and what's the effect of that? Now imagine, for example, if you had this kind of situation, okay, let's say the sensor at the front, all it can tell you is, is there something there or not, okay, on or off. Okay, now let's say the, there, there is no sensation, it's off. That's not going to be a very useful information for you because what if, like, you know, that metal bar is just swinging, you know, just a centimeter to the side of it and it's going to hit your head, right? Or let's imagine the other situation it's on. But then what? Does it mean there's a small thing in front of your head that just blocks the sensor? Or is it an entire wall that's in front of you? Well, you're not going to know just by having this one sensor going in your forehead. So, what do people do? they start moving, okay? If I start moving my head like this, I'm gonna convert the sensor, which is just a one-dimensional sensor, binary sensor, into a two-dimensional one. Now it's a line, okay? I'm a scanning a line. If I move up and down as well, I'm gonna start you know, getting a whole two-dimensional picture and maybe I can even move back and forth to get a sense of you know, what's, the, where, what's the distance to the objects in front of me. That's very interesting because it means that our interaction with the world now is what determines the dimensionality of our experience, not the device. 
Okay? Whereas, the, let's say, the classical design methodology is let's add as many dimensions as possible to the interface to get a, get a richer experience. Here it's the opposite. It's like, let's encourage the subject to be as active as possible, as interactive as possible, and that's what's going to constitute the richness of the experience. And the upshot here is what they're saying is that once people are starting to move in this way, you can record that movement and you can analyze it. And it gives us the opportunity to study how exactly does the technology become integrated into our movements and how does it change our experience. Something that would be completely hidden if all the richness is in the interface. Okay, if I just stand still and I have stock market data playing on my stomach all day long and eventually I say, aha, yes, tomorrow I should buy this stock. Right? As a scientist, you're like, well, okay, that's nice, but how did that happen, right? Whereas if you have this approach, you'll see, ah, okay, now they're moving their head, now they're learning to go back and forth. You can actually see the process of perceptual learning taking place in front of you in the world. So we basically accepted this minimalism approach and with some colleagues uh, from uh, my master's degree uh, we made a first attempt to go all, as minimal as we could and basically my, f my friend and colleague Adam Spear said okay let's just take a standard flashlight which in the UK is called a torch and instead of having a light we'll just put in a distance sensor ultrasonic sensor okay and then this is a haptic torch. It gives you haptic feedback, tactile feedback. And people were able to use this to find their way around. One channel, right? One degree of freedom. And the idea in this one was that you had a little dial that could turn. And then I said, well, dials turning is quite abstract, right? Because what does turning to the right mean compared to turning to the left? What if you just use vibration, like this, you know, whisker hat? And that's the origin of the inactive torch, which we have uh, over here, uh, and which you'll have the opportunity to try out uh, after I finish my presentation to see whether you can learn how to perceive with your hands. Okay, I'm going to spoil you because the rest of the talk is about that device. Should we just do it now? Mm. No, let's. Yes? Okay, we have one volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, it's okay. I'll, t I'll tell you first, because basically what that means is that the experience will just happen faster, I hope. Okay, because otherwise you basically spend some time familiarizing yourself with the device, trying to understand how it works and so on. I'm basically going to give you all of that information. And then hopefully what you will find is that if you use it for a couple of minutes, a few minutes, you'll see what it does to your own experience. And it'll be faster than if uh, everybody has to take like, I don't know, like 15 minutes, half an hour to, to use it. Okay, so the original motivation for this, and this will be interesting for the philosophers, is the following. Uh, there was a big debate in the literature about what is it like to experience sensor substitution. And there are several different positions, competing positions. Jesse Prince said in response to some inactive proposals, that my best guess is that prosthetic vision devices simply, should be simply, allow subjects to make automatic inferences about where objects are located in space as a result of tactile information. Okay, in fact, so according to him, there's absolutely no sensory substitution. Right? It's not even a new modality. It's just tactile sens you know, sensations in your hand, and you're doing a cognitive effort to deduce what that means. And by the way, it's a possible strategy. You know, if you feel something vibrating harder and you know that means something is closer, you can think, oh, it's vibrating more now, that must mean something is coming closer. So it is possible. But you know, is that everything that goes on? Block says, there is doubt as to whether the phenomenology of TVSS, this tactile visual substitution system, is exclusively visual, and perhaps TVSS is a case of spatial perception by a tactile sensation. So it's a kind of tactile perception. So at least now he's accepting the possibility that this is perception rather than inference. But he's doubting whether this is uh, actually from one modality to another. And you can see why. Because if I close my eyes and I touch my computer, 
I can perceive its shape, for example, right? I can perceive its location in space. So tactile perception does have a spatial component. So maybe that's the only thing that we're hooking into here. Alvin Noe uh, says, it is reasonable to admit that the resulting experiences are, if not fully visual, then vision-like to some extent. So he you know, goes you know, from the tactile to the visual. And then Avray and Mayin, Mayin who, who are kind of part of this Compiègne school, say, the experience after sensor substitution is a transformation, extension, or augmentation of our perceptual capacities, rather than being something equivalent or reducible to an already existing sensory modality. So they're also talking about perception, but now they're not saying it was any of the existing ones, but it could be a completely different one. So who's right? Okay, so they're basically talking about the same device, about the same experience, but we have at least four different positions here. Okay, and then this is a very interesting problem, not just for human-computer interaction, but for consciousness science in general. So maybe we can come back to this later in the week when, when consciousness is going to be our topic. And also tomorrow after the, um, the morning keynote, we're going to talk about perception uh, as well. So the question is here is, how come we can have such different opinions about people's subjective experience? And how can we do science with this? How can we arbitrate these different opinions or hypotheses? These are very hard questions. But if you don't answer them, it basically means that you know, anything goes. I have no idea how you experience the world, or you, me, or you know, how do we even get along, right? If everything is completely you know, possible that what I experience as red, maybe you experience as blue, or actually you're feeling it as touch, and I would never know the difference, right? Are we really like in that kind of situation? And I doubt it, right? It feels like we're pretty much on the same page for most of the time in how we experience the world. So there are some methodological issues here. Okay. But one, without going into the details here, I think one of the things that applies to all of the people who made these judgments is that they never try the device. They have absolutely no personal experience of what it's like to use a sensor substitution device. All they're doing is interpreting subjective reports of people and then trying, in the context of the best science and philosophy, to interpret what that might mean. Right? But can we do a science of consciousness and subjective experience without ever actually experiencing the experience that we're talking about? It is a, there's a fundamental issue here, right? And it's not just human computer design. It's particular to this one, because if we want to design better interfaces, we have to somehow deal with the problem of how do we measure user experience, for example, right? This is a practical problem that any company wanting to get into this kind of market needs to face. But what do they do? They get lots and lots of people to try out their interfaces and try to analyze their experience, including the designers trying out their own interfaces. But apparently, in cognitive science, nobody has to do that. We can just you know, sit in our armchairs and just speculate about what the experience is like. So the main key point of this device was, we need a device that's so simple, so easy to learn, freely available on the internet, anybody could build their own if they want to, in order to put this kind of debate on a concrete foundation, right? where we say, if you have never tried it, you know, your opinion about it is nice, but it's not as, let's say, valid or viable, as opinion of someone who has had a first-hand experience of what it is like. It's a little bit like this classical situation in the history of science, when Galileo uh, invented good telescopes and started looking at the stars and finding out all kinds of things that kind of annoyed the church, he was put on trial, right? He said, no, no, the Bible and everything, you know, the, the Pope said so-and-so, therefore there cannot be this, you know, phenomenon in the sky that you report to us. And his response was, why don't you just look through the telescope and see for yourself? To which they, of course, said, no, 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 we don't need to do that because, you know, we already have the book and the law and, you know, he's, uh, the Pope is infallible, so, you know, why would we want to look through the telescope? It's, a, it's extreme, but a lot of consciousness science is a little bit like this, where you have very, very important people making pronouncements about what consciousness is or isn't like, and you wonder, like, you know, 
what's their qualification to make judgments about this experience, in particular when it comes to human-computer interaction, talking about experiences with devices that they've never tried out for themselves. And part of the issue is, of course, how do you get access to these devices? You know, the TVSS, for example, has been decommissioned ages ago, right? and even the more recent versions of it, I mean, I don't know exactly when this picture was taken, but look at this patient, and they have to carry a whole cart full of computer technology behind her to even enable this, right? And yes, okay, this is better. Now it's all on your smartphone. But this is a commercial company. It's very expensive. You can't do really do research with it because it's closed and so on. And, and I've tried one of these, and it's not very comfortable to have your tongue stimulated the whole time with electrical currents. I don't know if you have a kid ever licked a battery, like, you know. If not, you can try it out at home later today and see what it's like. Um, but anyway, it's not very pleasant, okay? So we decided not to go there, and we basically created this device to go around lots of conferences, and this is Adrian Cousins, also philosopher of perception, and basically allow people to, in a very short time, get a sense of what it's like to have your senses substituted. So what's the comparison? Here's TBSS, the brain parts company on one side. So they get light and a two-day image, right? Okay, it's a, just a digital photo, basically, okay? But in black and white. And the output is touch, also in 2D, with an array of mechanical vibration or electrical vibration, okay? But it's also a prefabricated representation, so the designers basically uh, think about uh, how should we represent the information of the camera uh, on, on, your, on your body. Downside, it's expensive, intrusive, hard to learn, and commercial. So um, the person who was talking about, oh, I see myself for the first time, I think that was like after three months of using it. Okay, we have a hard time getting students to hold this device for an hour or two hours. That's already a lot. You know, it's like, I'm so busy, I cannot hold this device for two hours. So for three months, I mean, you know, just forget about it. You can never do any science with that. So in this case, with the inactive torch, the input is distance instead of light, so we don't have to do, interpret the, the image. Okay, it's just uh, one distance measure. It's a s single dimension, which in, can be a binary, but uh, it's useful to have it continuous to allow it a little bit more of a smooth interaction. The output can be worn anywhere in your body, but hand is like a natural way to put it. It's a little bit like a blind man's, blind man's cane without the cane. It's cheap, non-intrusive, easy to learn, and it has a Creative Commons license. So if you go online and look for the inactive torch, you'll basically find the blueprints and the codes. And you can, if you have some engineering skills, you can try to build your own. And the more kind of research-oriented version is this one. It's the one that we have over there which allows us to do uh, psychological studies. And one of the ones that uh, I'm going to present to you now, which uh, um, is quite interesting in the sense of looking at the possibility of transformation, has to do with um, the fact that most studies with tools contrast physical devices like sticks, rakes, you know, things that allow you to manipulate at a distance, versus something like laser pointers, okay? So you have, in that case, uh, another thing that allows you to do something at a distance, like, you know, if I had to uh, point to something or divide something at a distance, I could do it by using a stick or I could use it by doing a laser pointer, and they find that uh, you don't find transformation of perception of space or perception of your body in the case of the laser pointer. Okay, that's the kind of control condition. But what about the inactive torch? because it also does something of our distance, okay, it gives you a sense of the distance, but it doesn't allow you to manipulate your environment. Okay, it, it, it tells you, yeah, there's something in front of me, but it doesn't allow you to then, you know, knock it over or touch it or poke it or something like that, like a stick, so it's a, it's a weird kind of hybrid. Okay, so what this device allows us to ask then, something that is uh, ambiguous in current experiments, is what is it about tools that changes our experience? Is it the extended reachability, the fact that I can knock things over with a stick, or the fact that I can perceive at a distance? Okay, so if a blind man moves the stick along the ground, 
he will have sensations at the tip of the stick. You can all practice this at home. Take a, take a stick, take a pen, and then, you know, ask someone, put something in front of me, and then try to explore what it is and find out what it is. You'll quickly realize that you're not paying attention to the tactile sensations on your hand where you're holding the stick, but your attention is where you're making contact with the world. Okay? So it's not just for blind people. Everybody can, can try this. If you have a pen in your hand, just try it. Go across the seat, and you'll quickly see that your, your experience incorporates the device and, and all the way to the tip. Okay, so that's the kind of distal perception. Okay, so how do we sort this out? On the one hand, perceiving at a distance, okay, so the blind man, but also that includes manipulability, right? Like a rake, I can do things at a distance. The problem, the scientific problem here, is that comparisons between elongated tools and laser pointers cannot distinguish between distal perceivability, okay, I see the laser pointer at a distance, or I can, you know, touch something at a distance with the stick, and distal manipulability. The problem is that the stick includes both, right? So which are the necessary and sufficient conditions? Okay, this is how the philosopher would frame it. Okay, so here are the possibilities. Perhaps we need both in order to have our experiential transformation, distal movement and distal sensation, like a stick. In the inactive case, in active torch case, all we have is distance sensation, so we perceive at a distance, but we cannot manipulate at a distance. And potentially, with virtual reality or something like that, we could also test what happens if we only have distal movement, but we don't get any feedback. Okay, so we can separate out these components. What kind of tool is the inactive torch? So it allows us to perceive at a distance, but it doesn't allow us to manipulate at a distance. So what does this mean for experience of the world and experience of your body? So here's the experiment, and uh, I'm going to just give you some, some highlights. So we basically created mazes. This is the first study we did. There are some follow-ups. Uh, and we blindfolded people and asked them to use a, an early version of the device to find a way around. Uh, here's the protocol. So we evaluated their arm sensations. So where do you feel being touched on your arm? Uh, we explained what the device is. We asked them to do the maze. Um, we evaluated the arm again, and then we gave them a questionnaire about their experience. Okay, so most people more or less got the task. They were able to move around in this maze without knocking into things too much. And so this seems to suggest that, well, if you just looked at behavior, yes, they were able to use the device to, per to perceive the, the path in front of them. And if you look at their experience, here's, uh, you know, they had the option of disagree, neither disagree or, or agree. Uh, for the statement, I experienced my focus of attention mainly on the obstacle I perceived in front of me. Most people agreed, so that seems distal perception is taking place. Another version of that question is, I experienced the contours of the maze out in the world at a distance away from my hand. So again, most people agreed with that. And so maybe this suggests that also their experience of the arm should also become extended, right? So this is uh, how we tested it. You know, they had to hold out their arm under a table. Um, and then we basically pointed to where they were supposed to... Uh, uh, they were pointing to where we were touching them, and we recorded the deviation of where they were pointing to for to the actual touch. However, we didn't find any evidence of any change. Okay, and there are many issues that are going on here. Um, a null result is always hard to interpret. But basically, uh, under these conditions, we didn't find them to have the sensation of having a longer arm. And if we look at the questionnaire, um, we asked about uh, if the finding the maze was like touching. Actually, it was kind of like a bimodal distribution. A lot of people disagreed, a lot, some people agreed. And then we actually explicitly asked them, uh, whether they had the sense that the arm itself had become extended. And again, like the tendency is towards saying no. Okay, so, and that's consistent with the behavioral data. Seems there was generally no clearly defined experience of the touching arm becoming extended. So maybe that suggests that actually this device is more like visual substitution, right? Because in vision, 
We have also distal perception. I can see all of you. You can see me. But we don't have the sense of our face growing out into the audience, right? Or something like that. So actually, we are very much stick where we are, and yet we still have a distal experience. So what if the device is a little bit like that? We already looked at the touching question, but there was another question we asked. Using the device to find my way through the maze was like seeing. It was a clear no as well. Actually, no, that was, it didn't feel like that. And then we had this ambiguous question. Was it like feeling? And then most people said yes. But then it's hard to interpret what they mean, right? Feel your way through the maze. So to some extent, it's funny, right? So actually the people's different opinions reflects the philosopher's differences in opinion. Seems like there might be many ways of experiencing it, or we don't have the right vocabulary to describe it. Anyway, it's quite clear that something is going on here, um, but people are not sure what it is that's going on here. On the other hand, and this is, uh, I'm going to finish here. Well, our original hypothesis was that using the device, and given that it permits you to perceive at a distance, uh, we should find evidence that the arm should also become extended, like the tool use studies. Right? But maybe that's not what we should have expected. Okay, there's an interesting work here by Galiza and Sinigaglia, who distinguish uh, two aspects. How we experience our world depends on our potential for effective sensation, a distal perception. But how we experience our body depends on our potential for effective manipulation. Okay, so your sense of embodiment is basically constituted by your sense of manipulability or what you can do with this, your body. Okay, and so if there's a tool that allows you to do things at a distance, well, your sense of embodiment will also extend into that distance. But if you're just perceiving at a distance and without being able to manipulate it, that doesn't bring with it your, your embodiment, a change of your sense of embodiment. Okay? So actually, in this, we, actually the data we found is consistent with this hypothesis. Okay? So because precisely, this device allows you to perceive at a distance, so object, uh, objects feel like they're out there in the world and not just you know, vibrations directly attached to your fingers, but you can't manipulate it. Just like you know, seeing the, the screen doesn't allow you to suddenly you know, move it with just at, uh, at a distance. So in this sense, you know, maybe we actually found evidence that is consistent with this. And if so, this shows us that some of the principles can be scientifically derived, can be studied. Now, for example, if you want to, de to design an interface that only affects your embodiment but not your distal perception, or you want a device that changes how the world appears to you but keeps your body the same, you can start using these kinds of principles to think about what kind of interface you want to design. And of course, this is just you know, the very beginning, but it gives us the kind of idea of how cognitive science and human-computer interaction can interrelate and mutually benefit. And that's all for now. Thank you.